Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales, both on and off the felt. Hello and welcome to Poker Stories, a podcast brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. Uh, This is episode number 55, featuring 33-year-old Shannon Shore. Uh, Shannon wasn't even 21 when he got started. He won a satellite to the Aussie Millions when he was only 20 and ended up finishing fourth for $200,000. Later that summer, after finally turning 21, he chopped the Bellagio Cup main event for more than half a million dollars. It was at that point that Shannon realized he wasn't going to go back to the University of Alabama. At least not right away. Uh, He made numerous major final tables while traveling all over the world. Uh, He won side events on the EPT and had huge scores on the World Poker Tour and at the World Series of Poker. In fact, Shannon was so consistent during that stretch that in 2013, he was ranked number 7 on GPI's Poker Player of the Decade list. Uh, Like most players, uh, he wasn't immune from the downswings and the anxiety and stress that comes from those downswings. He eventually went back to school and earned his degree, and it seems like these days he's found a nice balance between poker and the rest of his life. Uh, Shannon is coming off of his best run ever in the WSOP main event. Uh, This summer he finished 39th for just under $190,000. He now has 6.6 million in career live tournament earnings. That's enough intro. Here's my conversation with Shannon Shore. Shannon, welcome to the neighborhood. Thank you. Really glad to be in Vegas. Yeah, by that I meant Vegas, obviously, and also my literal neighborhood. I'm not too far from my house, so thank you for the convenient interview rendezvous point. Um, How are you liking your brief time in Vegas so far? I'm loving it. I've been out here about three weeks. My fiance and I drove a moving truck across the country from oh Alabama, <laughs> so that was a fun experience. I did that move from South Florida myself, so uh, not, not to one-up you. <laughs> Lost all my luggage in Louisiana. Oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a brutal drive, right? What'd you do, I-10 the whole way west yeah. over the Grand, uh, I mean the the dam? Yes. Yeah. We, uh, it took us three days. We stayed the night in hotels, and I didn't want to kill myself because I was planned on playing a ton of poker when I mm-hmm. got out here. And ever since we arrived, I've just been going hard, playing like I think sixty-hour weeks for the with all this Bellagio stuff that was going on. So I'm ready to chill for a little bit and relax for the holidays. Yeah, enjoy the new place, the new uh, city. Uh, obviously, you're no stranger to Vegas. You've been coming out here for what? 14, 15 years at this point. Yeah, I think at least 13. So what was the ultimate decision uh, or the ultimate tipping point for you to leave Alabama and come to Vegas? Well, I was using Alabama as a base between like tons of travel, both for leisure and poker tournaments. And I've just honestly become so exhausted with travel. Yeah. Well, no offense to Alabama, but it's not exactly a travel hub. You know what I mean? Like, not a great connecting point as far as... Uh... You know what? It actually, believe it or not, it, a lot of people think that, but it worked pretty well. Birmingham's got a pretty really? nice airport that I can get. I played a lot of tournaments at Borgata and Florida, mm-hmm. and I can get direct to Vegas. So all those were, like, really easy stops for me. But I just mean as far as there's no poker actually in Alabama. Exactly. Meaning you have to get on a plane for anything. Exactly, yeah. So you are not you weren't a big fan of the travel? I mean, I loved traveling. I've been to almost 40 countries now and been fortunate to see like most of the regions in the world. And that's just been, it's changed my life traveling, but it's, it's time to uh, relax. I'd like to, the thing with travel is you don't really get to get in a rhythm or like develop hobbies or, you know, establish these friendships and stuff. So I'm excited to do some of that and also have poker at my fingertips here in Vegas. Mm -hmm. Have you gotten to experience, I mean, obviously you played Bellagio like crazy uh, the pl- the past couple of weeks. Um, have you been down there for cash games? Have you been able to just get up in the middle of the night when you feel the urge and go play? Or I played some cash uh, mm-hmm. at Bellagio and Wynn, and I've been enjoying that. I look forward to getting into a routine of that and probably additionally play some online. All right, let's go back to the beginning, uh, to the very beginning, 1985. 
uh middle child <laughs> yeah what was little shannon getting into uh i was always or i was a very shy kid mm-hmm. uh i grew up in birmingham to like my parents were amazing. I had two amazing sisters and just had like the perfect Southern family life. Like I never had any, you know, I'm, a lot of people can't say that. So I'm really fortunate for that. And I've always had the support of everybody in my family. Um, you just mean there was no drama at home? Yeah, no drama. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they've been super supportive of my, of my career and everything. Um, but you, but growing up, you were shy. I was, uh, yeah, I was very shy. I remember you telling me that you were a little bit of a, a bookworm uh, to start. Yeah, I was always kind of a bit of a nerd in school. Mm-hmm. Uh, in addition to being an athlete, but I love baseball became my passion early on, and I just uh, lived sports for from like age five to eighteen. I played baseball, basketball, football. I was always outdoors and playing sports, and that was my thing. And then I found poker when I got into college. Right, so you are uh, doing well in school. You graduate high school. Uh, is it just a given that you're going to go to U of A? <laughs> yeah, I almost went to UAB, Alabama Birmingham, mm-hmm. and played baseball. Uh, I had a pretty successful high school prep career, um, but I just <laughs> so you could be an athlete at the small school. You could go watch athletes at the big school. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I in high school I went down to Alabama a little bit and <laughs> did some partying and just saw you know as an eighteen year old seeing that world mm-hmm. you know going from like a bit of a you know smaller community to just seeing this craziness. I think it just it took me. I knew I I knew that I had to be there. I don't think everyone understands like the big college experience. I went to Florida, and I, it's really hard to explain to people the cult-like <laughs> mentality that you get when you go to one of these schools. And Alabama, obviously, is in the middle of you know a dynasty when it comes to football. So I imagine your experience was interesting. Yeah, it was. It was cool. We weren't that great when I went to when I you know first started school. Those are my years. Florida. <laughs> right, yeah, that, that was you. <laughs> and then I, uh, so I went to school for a couple of years. I got into online poker, and that that went uh, pretty well. I won a trip to Australia. Yeah, so you weren't even 21 yet. You just, uh, well, what made you even put money online? I started playing house games with friends for five bucks. We played seemingly every night. Yeah. Uh, at, like, my apartment that I had as 18-year-olds, I guess. And then we just sort of a couple of us started making deposits online. I lost probably thirty five hundred bucks, fifty dollars at a time. Wow! I had a co op job. I was an engineering student, so I had a co op job. So I was making money and able to afford uh, afford that kind of degeneracy. So what was it? Just because a lot of people they win on their first try, and that's what why they're still playing poker. Mm-hmm. You know, because they got hooked on the winning feeling. What made you keep coming back even after it wasn't successful at first? I think like. A lot of people, I was just like hooked on the on the gambling aspect of it. And to be honest, it was gambling for me yeah. back then. I didn't really know what I was doing. My only experience with the game was playing with with a few friends. But I started reading a little bit and uh, actually met Jonathan Little, uh, who was probably my first big mentor mm-hmm. in the game. We started talking on AOL Instant Messenger. Oh, how did that happen? <laughs> we were playing Party Poker. We used to have a chat feature back in the day. Okay. And one day I was berating some <laughs> a player like in the <laughs> in the chat in uh, at the table, and John Little like private messaged me. He was like, "Quit berating this guy." He and I were both regulars in the sit and goes at that time, <laughs> and then somehow we exchanged uh, AOL instant message. He was like, "Don't scare away the fish," exactly. or was he trying to just give you some helpful advice? No, that was basically it. <laughs> <laughs> He's just looking out for himself. Yeah, that's funny. And then uh, the rest is history. We started traveling and playing a bunch together live, and uh, he was hugely instrumental in in my career i wouldn't be here without him yeah well anybody who's listened to uh my podcast with jonathan little will definitely understand uh that he's always been like that from the beginning very uh workmanlike and devoted to the grind Mm -hmm. um all right so you're playing online poker and uh things are going well enough to the point where you're playing big live satellites to to go abroad yeah, there was there were step satellites back in the day to Australia, and uh, 
I was playing a ton of sit and goes like that was my specialty and they, they were in sit and go format so like all the regulars I saw were playing those so it was like okay Australia I'll, I'll take a hack at that to that point I think I'd only ever been to like Tennessee and North Carolina and stuff. wow <laughs> so you hadn't even really left the tri-state area yeah exactly <laughs> so uh, I was like all right I'll give that a shot and uh, I remember working it up I think I bought into maybe like step three at 500 bucks and then worked my way to the uh two thousand dollar satellite all right so this you were taking shots at this this wasn't exactly like a flukish you turn five dollars into a, a seat kind of thing exactly you wanted to go to australia you got your package you you won the seat i mean this was a goal of yours exactly yes yeah, so i was it was just i saw that i saw the same people that were playing sit and goes that weren't very good were playing these satellites so i was like okay i'll take a shot but i wasn't even playing like mtt's at that time at all yeah uh, you were still in the gamble mode. I was, yeah, just sit playing sit and goes and stuff. But yeah, I, uh, I'll never forget. I won a flip to win that seat, Ace King versus Queens River King. <laughs> and, uh, that sort of was the start. Right. What happens if that king doesn't hit the river? <laughs> yeah, it could have been a very different story. Wh- where's Shannon at that point? <laughs> right. Probably, probably doing some engineering work in engineering Alabama. Engineering Alabama. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you get to Australia. You're what? Well, you're what? 19? 19. 19, so you can't even, you know, gamble in a, in the casinos in the States, but you're in Australia, and things go pretty well in the main event? Yeah, I ran spectacularly um, in that tournament. I, there were a couple of like, key spots where I got there on the mm-hmm. end, like, <laughs> in huge all-in pots where I was, I was, <laughs> I remember I was, like, playing so crazy online. Back then, you could just play so recklessly and of just course. run over people, you know? Um, and I, that's how I was approaching that tournament and everybody knew it and they were like probably making adjustments, but I still was just going for it. And I got, I got there and ran like God at, at the good, at the right time, ended up finishing fourth, uh, for about $200,000, I think. So 200 grand for a college student who just lost $3,500 in, <laughs> in redepositing. I mean, that's gotta be pretty crazy for you at that point. It was. Yeah. I, uh, Right before that Australia trip, I decided to take the semester off of uh, school because I knew I wouldn't be able to catch up on the engineering coursework, you know, going down and missing the first Right, that's right. Aussie Millions is in January, right? The start of the second semester. Exactly. So rather than be behind, you just said, screw the rest of the semester. Yeah, I intended on picking it up and stuff, but then, like, everything just happened so fast. I was like, I have to, I have to continue. Or later that summer and. uh Right, so you go, for, you get the two hundred thousand in in Australia, and you ride the momen- that momentum all the way to. Uh, I, I guess it was during the World Series of Poker, but it was at the Bellagio. Yeah, the Bellagio Cup. I ended up chopping and winning uh, for about I think it was five seventy five to end the summer. Right, so yeah, you start off that series by winning a one k for one hundred twenty six grand. Then you chop the main event, the ten k Bellagio Cup. For what you said, five seventy-five. How can you possibly go back to school at this point, right? Yeah, that's that's kind of what I was thinking. It it felt like a, I just kind of tried to trust myself about what the right decision was. I knew mm-hmm. school would school would always be there. I intended on finishing, and I later did. Mm-hmm. Uh, but oh, yeah, we'll it, just, <laughs> it felt felt good to, uh, you know, to just go with it, kind of. Let's talk about those early successes. Uh, at you know the two Bellagio Cup wins. Aussie Millions, uh, you had uh, you had a lot of success at Bellagio, obviously over the years. What were you doing right at that time um, versus how the fields were back then? What do you think was working for you? Just blind aggression, or Mo- mostly blind aggression? Uh, I was playing a ton online, so you know, without I wasn't studying per se, but just like you know, I had a sense of yeah. a sense of how you know, the right ranges to play, I think. Would you say you were like, I mean, because when people think back to those poker boom days as to who the aggressives were, they were thinking like uh, Gus Hansen, Michael Mizraki. Were you at that level or did you have more of a, a break pedal on your game? I, I went pretty hard. Maybe, maybe not quite as, as hard as those guys, but I think if you ask some of the people from back in the day at that time, they'd, they'd say I was pretty aggro. So when did the adjustment come? Would, would people just eventually get good enough to the point where they're they start playing back at you you can't get away with the same stuff anymore or exactly i can remember distinctly it was probably around like 
2008 or so. Mm-hmm. And there were a lot, there was like a new breed of, there was a lot more online guys coming up. There were, like I was 24 at the time, and there were a ton of like 21 year olds coming up who had been playing a bunch on stars and stuff and knew how to defend against it. And they would just like three bet you relentlessly and stuff. Yeah. And uh, so I had, I had to make the adjustment. When you, uh, you, you talked about your decision to go back to school eventually. What was the initial re- uh, conversation like with your parents about uh, quitting school for poker? I mean, it's hard to argue with your results at the time, but... Uh, like I said earlier, they've always been so supportive of me and everything I, I did, so I wasn't like hesitant to, uh, to ask them or anything. I knew they'd support me, so I just told you know told them the situation that I'd won this trip to Australia, and they were they were fully supportive. I've got two pretty chill parents, so it worked out well. Well, that's all you told them going to Australia. You, I mean, there had to have been more that came after that because the initial plan was to go back oh, right. in the fall, right? Um, well, this was right before Australia. That what was it like? Late two thousand five was when I really started to like build up a bankroll mm-hmm. online and stuff. I don't know, I built maybe run up like 30,000 or something. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that's that's about the time that I won Australia. And yeah, I told him I was going to go do that and then, you know, resume in the in the fall. But then the summer was huge and stuff. So I just decided to put it off for the time being. Right, because there's a big difference between your parents saying, hey, yeah, go ahead, take the summer off, take a semester off. And then saying, oh, you're going to do this forever as like for a living? Were there any hesitations there, or was it all just go Shannon, and go? I'm sure deep down they had they had those. <laughs> you said they hid their their reservations <laughs> from you. Yeah, maybe, but they're. Uh, I, I would say neither of my parents are very traditional. Uh, they both have a lot of kind of you know both traveled and had life experience, and uh, they kind of are all about being happy. So they knew that I, I was in it. Now. Uh, before we get to the, the downswing part of your early career, which no one likes to talk about, mm-hmm. can you talk about some of the fun times, the experiences you had, like the, your, your crew during that stretch? Sure. What yeah. you got to do? <laughs> yeah. I mean, those early years were amazing, as you can imagine, being like 20 to 23 and just like being all over the world, traveling. Yeah. Uh, I've got a number of great friends. Who I, we partied a lot. <laughs> we drank a lot of alcohol and we were out, you know, a lot of like betting sports against each other and stuff. So it was like a nonstop party, basically. Did you have any crazy prop bet stories? I, I was never big into prop betting, honestly. It was mainly just like betting on games and stuff. But uh, Mike Katz, Jesse Aguinuma, Adam Geyer, mm-hmm. Justin Young, Eric Baldwin, John Little, Adam many Geyer, did I say him? Many of those have been on this podcast. You can go check them out in the archives. Just a lot. I mean, we had just we were just always hanging out, you know, sharing hotel rooms, traveling mm-hmm. around the world, playing online sessions together. Um, so yeah, it was just definitely some of the fondest memories of my poker career. So when you jumped off the second floor of your house, <laughs> that wasn't a prop bet. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was sixteen vodkas after being at uh, what was that Treasure Island nightclub back in the day <laughs> on a Wednesday oh, night. Oh, what was the name of that nightclub? Was that that wasn't Jet? No can't remember yeah but yeah <laughs> not <laughs> that was yeah a lot of vodka yeah so yeah you obviously had your your share of experiences what what about your favorite location uh when you were when you're out and about what did you like going to the most uh over the years i would say europe just being in like barcelona is mm-hmm. one of my favorite spots I, I really like the lifestyle in europe just walking around and stuff australia was big, obviously big fan of siestas yeah. <laughs> uh, Australia was amazing. I love playing at Bellagio. Obviously, that place has treated me really well, and I just love the energy in there. Um, Amsterdam. You do seem to have a fair number of your results um, coming at the Bellagio. Do you buy into that whole the comfort of the room, uh, the familiarity with it, or is it just you happen to run good when, when you're in Bellagio? Uh, I think that... Anything that sort of gives you confidence or puts you in like a relax. For me, over the, finally, I've, I've realized, and like it took me lots of years, but being in the right mental state for playing mm-hmm. poker, I, I think, is the key. So, like, most of my time nowadays is geared towards being in the right mental state. But yeah, like Bellagio, 
you're just in a I'm just in a great mental state when I'm there so I'm relaxed I can you know trust my plays I think being able to trust your decisions is huge let's talk about a little bit about your mindset uh, I want to get to some things you wrote after your deep run in the main event this summer uh, but let's talk a little bit about about the downswing and going back to school and was was going back to school a result of, of you saying I need a backup plan in case this doesn't work out or was it a matter of just fulfilling that promise to yourself or did you just miss Alabama parties <laughs> was the football team too good to ignore you know like what, what what was it mainly I don't know I guess it was a rule I sort of set with myself that I can remember as a kid like my parents uh, my parents are both college graduates, both mm-hmm. as are my sisters, and it was really important to me um, to finish. So I, you know, made a rule with myself that I would go back and finish, and it have it, it came at a good time because I was down swinging, and I was like, I need to, I need to get away. Keep in mind, down swinging and up swinging, just playing these live tournaments is like. It's just so much variance. Even yeah. even a career of live tournament variance is just insane. So. But it's hard not like when you're just playing live tournaments. It's hard not to like focus on the result because that's all you have. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I was downswing. I think '07 was a rough year for me, and I went back in uh, January of '08 maybe to school. So yeah, it seemed seemed like a good time. Uh, finished up with engineering again, or no? I actually switched to business management. Okay. Um, I kind of wish I would have stayed in engineering, but at the time I was like, <laughs> I still wanted to devote a bunch of time to playing online poker while I was there and stuff. <laughs> so, and like engineering, I didn't see, I didn't expect to be an engineer. I just didn't see it as, as practical. Um, so I switched to business management and ended up finishing in that. And how much did does having that degree, which you're not using, you right. know what I mean? How much has it changed your life at all? You know, like, do you feel more secure? Like, do you feel... Like you have a net? <laughs> no, honestly, I think my degree is probably pretty useless. <laughs> but uh, just over. Besides that, I think the benefit of like having those social experiences, you know, mm-hmm. that's one of the most underrated aspects. Is like the social experiences you gain in college, as you know. Yeah. Is uh, you know stuff that you know if you spend instead during, if you spend those influential years of your life just in front of a computer playing online all the time, then. That's going to be a key, uh, I guess, hindrance to your development. Did you go? Uh, you obviously went through a weird transformation as far as like the uh, way you approach your health, uh, fitness. Mm-hmm. Um, you were never a fat guy, <laughs> but you were definitely you went through a time where you you weren't as cut and in shape as you are in now. When did you find that? Well, I actually did get pretty big. <laughs> I got up to about. Um, 237 you say I pretty big that's still lower than my big <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, that first year of playing poker it was just like like i said a non-stop party it was yeah. steaks and desserts every meal and stuff um no exercise just playing poker um and then i remember in i think it was early early 08 maybe i did a weight loss bet with a guy and, okay and lost maybe 35 pounds, got down to under 200. And I remember later that year, I kind of put it back on. Well, how did you lose it the first time? I did the Atkins diet. Okay. Which I'm not, I don't think that's the best, <laughs> best well, long-term solution. Well, keep it off. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then I just fell back into the poker routine. And then made that I was, I guess, around 23, 24 then. And around 25, 26, I really like kicked it into into high gear and like today at 33 i'm in the best shape of my life Mm -hmm. my fiance is uh basically my life coach she cooks all our meals and plans our workouts and all that so having that you know yeah i've seen you with the home the home meals at the series (laughs) scarfing away yeah it's the eating those brain foods i mean i i just feel like a different human now so let's talk about uh what uh some of the things you wrote after your main event run this year this this summer obviously uh, for those who watch the coverage, a, a deep run in the World Series of Poker 10K main event uh, finished, what was it here, 39th for $190,000. Probably the most bittersweet $190,000 anybody can win. Yeah. <laughs> um, but still nice, a nice result and a deep run in a, in a crazy cool tournament to run deep in. What was, uh, well, first of all, tell me about that run and how, what you thought, or, or was it like a new experience for you? 
going that deep in an event that long. Yeah, it was definitely the highlight for me in terms of fun I've ever had playing poker. Mm -hmm. um, I'd had a bit of a rough summer to that point, as often happens during <laughs> playing just tournaments at the World Series. Yeah. And uh, basically the last... I've only really been playing live tournaments the last four or five years, and it hasn't really been going my way, honestly. Uh, that's why I'm excited to be out here and get to play poker regularly instead of just showing up and you travel somewhere and just show up and play. You, yeah, know, you get a few tournaments. Size exactly. That you could have, yeah. Nor do I feel like I've played my best poker because it's just like you have this sort of pressure on yourself to perform when you only get like so many chances, kind of. Yeah. So uh, now I'm, I feel, you know, I'm excited to play a lot of poker. But anyway, uh, back to the tournament. Yeah, I think I ended up busting middle of the day, day six. And to that point, I'd only, I think my best main event finish was maybe in the 370s or something early in my career. Um, but yeah, obviously ran, to get that deep, you have to run really well. But I uh, also think I played really well. I had, like I said, uh, my girl making me food and stuff <laughs> along the way. And I was able... I don't see how some guys do it because even living, I had an apartment maybe eight minutes from Rio. I came home, slept every night, uh, you know, eight hours, like from the time it ended to like getting up to play. And if you don't have the, if you're like staying in a hotel or like far away in a house or something, it's it's tough to like be in shape for no, that kind of grind. You're just not getting the right meals. You're not getting the right sleep. By week three, you're just scatterbrained. Exactly. And, and to that point, I'd played a pretty insane summer, like I always do, playing a bunch of tournaments. Uh, so I was pretty tired at that point. But yeah, ran ran really well and came up a little short, unfortunately. There's maybe one or two hands down the stretch that I that I kind of want back. But uh, six, six days in, you know, you're not always going to be <laughs> playing yeah. your best poker, so I try not to beat myself up too hard. But yeah, it was definitely... Uh, it was cool also to give you know my family and friends and uh, my fiance's family a glimpse into my world kind of because it was cool to be on playing live on ESPN that was I think my first time doing that you wrote um about your start that uh things got off you say things got off to a shitty start on quickly quickly down to around 32,000 from the 50,000 starting stack just an hour or so into the tournament bad thoughts started to enter my mind and I could feel myself getting stressed in the past, these thoughts were a lot more prevalent, but nowadays I feel like I'm mostly good at mitigating them. So what are you talking about when you mean these thoughts? Uh, is it just a thought of, uh oh, here's another losing tournament, or there's another 10K down the drain, or I can't ever get lucky when I need to... What, what, are, what is it that's prompting these thoughts, and how are they affecting you? I would say mostly that... Um just based on the fact that tournaments haven't been going exactly how I want, you know, mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah, would have those sort of thoughts of like, you know, feeling sorry for myself or why am I running so bad and stuff, which are just, they, those thoughts can't exist if you're going to play, you know, at the top of your game. Um, so just downswing, I mean, it's really hard not to get caught up in, in the results. It's easy to say, oh, I'm, I'm not going to be results oriented. I'm going to, you know, just right. keep going through each, each tough hand. If you each misplay decision, a hand, as long as I make each decision. And then... Yeah. But we're humans, right? We're not robots. So, um, yeah, it, it, the results definitely over the last few years put me through some pretty dark times, you know, it's, when you're putting everything into poker and then not getting the results you want, it can be it can be tough, especially when. But what do you mean by dark times? You mean like depression or just like anger? Yeah, a little bit. Just like you know, waking up in the morning. You know, it hurts when you're on 100k downswings, 200k downswings. Mm -hmm. uh, so just getting up, you know, trying to uh, you know get back to prepping. I you you know had a would like overeat sometimes or like drink too much or like smoke a little too much weed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I've been trying to cut all of that out of my life and just, uh, I've had really, uh, really good growth lately. Just like seeing the beauty and everything and, you know, not being dependent on any, you know, substance or anything like that. And just, uh, enjoying life, being more active, trying to get 10,000 steps a day, get outside early try to hydrate right away, journal, meditation. Those are all things that are part of my daily routine now. But you mentioned uh, the uh, the fear, I guess. There's a quote here that says, I have a huge fear of the future, which looking back is completely understandable given my career choice. 
I'm also definitely on the risk averse side of professional poker players. So how much of it is the pressure to succeed right then because you're uncertain about your retiring status or what you're going to do 20, 30 years from now? Mm-hmm. It's, I would say it, it's mostly that, you know, if you're, if you have a conventional career, you probably don't have those, you know, thought, you know, you know, the ne- when the next paycheck's coming. Yeah. Also there is, I definitely, there was a time when I had, when I was younger, I had more money than I do now. So I got used to like a little bit, uh, different sort of lifestyle, but now I'm just sort I don't, I don't require that now, but maybe a year ago I was, you know, was th- just like being peak stuck, yeah. not ha- not having that much money was like, I felt like I had to get back, which is just really flawed thinking. I'm just grateful for everything that I have now, I would say. Uh, you say you're risk averse as far as professional poker players go. My questions to you are, one, if you're risk averse, why be a professional poker player? And, and two... What does that even mean? I mean, you are a professional poker player, so you gotta have a little gamble in you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say, as as I get older, I guess I'm more risk averse. Like I have no, I'm a very low maintenance type guy. I don't require much. Um, I yeah, if I had it my way, I would I would take all the variance out of poker and just like get paid my equity every day. You know? <laughs> like I have no, I have no desire to like have like a you know million dollar house. Or you know, two cars or anything like that. Yeah. So uh, yeah, as, as long as I have enough to like all that extra shit, just like brings me stress. Honestly, for me, happiness is just like not having stuff bouncing around in my head, like that I've got to deal with and worry about. So now you don't have uh, the need for uh, the toys, yeah. the luxury items. So you could kind of play poker at a level that's balanced and healthy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but. You know, there's a lot of poker players out there who say, hey, you got to be shot, you got to take shots in your career, you got to always be willing to step up to the next level. Is there anything wrong with just picking a level and grinding it for the rest of your career? Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with anything as long as it makes you happy. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm still going to be playing like decent stakes and I still will take shots, good shots when I see them, but I'm not going to be taking like, you know, putting huge amounts of my bankroll, you know. But those things are over. <laughs> yeah, right. And, uh, yeah, I've got, like I said, I'm just grateful for what I have and, you know, still got it better than 99.9% of the world probably. So I'll take it. (laughs) Perspective. Uh, you mentioned putting in the work, um, and the frustration of not seeing the results come initially. Uh, what kind of work are you doing? Um, are you, are you one of those solver people or are you, are you, uh, are you getting on the GTO bandwagon? Yeah, I've definitely done a lot of solver work in the last year and a half or so. And uh, I've been through a couple of different training programs. Yeah. And just spend. I uh, played a decent bit on a decent bit online. Um, and just trying to become like very technically technically sharp, so I can you know when I'm playing against tough players, I can you know make good technical decisions. Did you notice any drastic changes between what your game was and what the GTO tells you to do? <laughs> Yeah, it's funny when you get like in a habit of playing poker, you, you you'll make a decision that like seems so clear to yourself and you or you know <laughs> you like something you've done a billion times yeah, before. Right? Like, and I'm yeah, like, of course wow. I, <laughs> I probably gave away a lot of equity <laughs> in some of these spots. But uh yeah, I feel really good about my about my game now at Blagio. I felt like I was at the top of my game and that I can compete with pretty much anybody. Can you tell us about one specific spot, maybe where there's a, a difference or Something where you would not think it would tell you to do. Um, I would say I would say mainly just like bet sizing. I was definitely betting too big in a lot of spots where I could get away with betting much smaller. Yeah, it's always interesting to me when I see uh, the top players min raise pre flop and then bet one point five the big <laughs> blinds on the flop, and I'm always like, I can't fold. I just called two bets pre-flop what's another bet and a half you know yeah and i'm like that's how i get into trouble (laughs) they're doing it for a reason yeah it's just it's fascinating to see how the games developed where back in the day we were opening to three and a half x and a three bet was to like 14 x now it's (laughs) open to two and three bets to five and a half so (laughs) pots don't get as big anymore now you lose a big pot you lose like 20 bigs I was talking to somebody the other day about the panic mode that people used to get into when they got the 10 big blinds. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And like all the books used to say, when you get the 10 big blinds, you know, sh- any ace, suited ace will do, any pocket pair, just shove. And now people are waiting until they get to four or five big blinds before they even start to panic. Yeah, true. Uh, all right, you mentioned uh, uh, substances that you may have turned to. You also um, said that uh, during your run this summer that you turned to weed to help you when you were feeling a little anxious during uh, the poker tournament. Uh, so my questions to you are, are you, when have you been a weed guy? Have you always been a... I never knew, known you as a weed guy. Yeah, I'm not really like... I don't like sit around and just like smoke to get stoned and mm-hmm. stuff. I just, uh, like I said, I have... I think a lot of poker players have a lot of anxiety. Like how could you not really in, in this business? So uh, a lot of that and... For me, there's a lot of things I, I want to keep on my health and stuff. So if I see anything slipping, I start to like get in panic mode a little bit. And I always want to make everybody happy. I spent way too much fucking time caring what people think. <laughs> um, so that brought me a ton of stress. But now I... Uh, yeah, so weed was good for like easing my anxiety. Uh, I definitely think I, I don't s- normally smoke when I play. Well, that's what's my next question going to be. Does weed actually help your poker game? Because there's there's poker players out there who swear by it, you know, certain strains or whatever. And there's other ones who say, no, it's strictly for after kind of thing. Yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, a lot of guys can do it and get away with it. And some sometimes I do in, in the smaller stuff. But I, I prefer to, like, just wake up and have my perfect, like, natural morning routine. And then when I get get there play poker, I just feel like I'm on another level. And then at the end of the day, it's super stressful trying to wind down after 12 hours, especially when you're playing, like, shorthanded against tough players. It's super stressful at the end of the day, so then t- sometimes I'll smoke. It's nice to have legal weed here in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yeah. A little bit different than Alabama. <laughs> um, all right, uh... Some rapid fire questions if you're ready to go. Biggest pot you've ever won or lost? Biggest pot I've ever won or lost? Probably. I'm so bad at recalling hands these days, but I would say somewhere probably in the 30K range. It could also be equity in the tournament. Oh, man. If that's the case, <laughs> <laughs> I've lost some, uh, some pretty big ones down the stretch. I mean, tournament like i honestly haven't my career i've come up short a lot like i have a lot of fifth six sevenths and shit so uh, we could talk about that if you want uh i mean you've you've have wins it's not like you you don't have any wins obviously so Mm -hmm. it's not like you have a reputation for not being a closer Mm -hmm. but it is kind of tough when you see some of the money that you've left on the table in those first second thirds that you you missed out on do you ever look Mm -hmm. back and go oh if only yeah i mean of course i think about it but uh, I just I'm I'm more concerned about now. You know how what am I doing now to to help my game? Obviously, yeah. I think I don't think I was ready to win though. As a, uh, I don't know. Now I I just think the timing of the universe wasn't right. Now I feel like I'm ready to win. You mean you? Well, had you not won at twenty one, twenty two, twenty three. Would you still be playing poker though? Um, <laughs> You're ready to win now, but you might yeah. have gotten to now. Yeah, true. Yeah, that said, I did win a tournament when I was 21. Um, I think I knew that I loved I loved poker like I loved baseball in terms of passion. So I think I still would have been playing in some capacity. Hopefully, I, you know, wouldn't have turned into a degen and dusted off everything that I had. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, I'm just glad everything. I'm just so happy now that I'm glad everything's worked out exactly how it has. Best swap or piece you've ever had of anybody? Ooh, I've run uh, run pretty good on swaps. Uh, the last early in my career, I had to pay out a bunch of swaps, and then the last four or five years, I've binked some swaps. Byron nice. Coverman was big for me. Oh, really? D. Peters has been big. Wait, for what, me. what was Byron's? Um. I better not say exactly which one. Oh, which event it was? It was yeah. a big one then. <laughs> <laughs> and David Peters hasn't stopped winning for the last five years. So yeah, I, I haven't had any of his you know monster stuff, but <laughs> but they've they were they're great friends and they've uh, helped me in that way. So that's been nice. Nice. Uh, best player we've never heard of. Oh man, I don't follow the poker cycle at all, nor do I like 
really mingle in the poker community because I got so much just going on with my own routine and stuff. So, what about a shout out to a buddy? I'm gonna give a shout out to Ryan Myers Buckhart. Ryan Myers Buckhart. Yeah. Okay. Best player you've never heard of. I've definitely never heard of him. <laughs> Tell me about Ryan. What's his game like? Um, he's, a, he's a friend of mine from San Diego, and he's just a great guy and a good player. All right. Uh, worst job you had before poker? Ooh. Have you have you had a real job? You know what? I the only I was a co-op student uh, when I was in engineering. And uh, sometimes they've given me shitty jobs like sweeping up and oh, okay. <laughs> clean, I clean it up. That was like a part-time teaching gig. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it was like I was uh, on a construction site. Got it. Uh, before that, I was a baseball umpire, which I absolutely love. So those are the only two jobs I've had. Other that than sounds like fun. I loved it. Yeah. What what ages were you umpiring? I did anywhere from like eight to twelve, or six to twelve. Okay, so you had to deal with. Mostly good kids and awful parents. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you must have some horror stories from that. I uh, I just recently got my daughter kicked out of her own sports league. But, you know, it wasn't because I choked out a ref or anything. Oh, wow. We need more <laughs> details on that. I just had a disagreement with the lady running it. That's oh, all. There you go. I didn't even scream. That'll happen. <laughs> <laughs> But I always say, like, you know, what kind of dad are you going to be, you know, when the, when your kid's out there on the field? Yeah. It's hard not to scream at those refs, yeah. even if they're, if they're you know, a kid trying their best. <laughs> sure, yeah. I'm, I'm curious to see because I, I love sports and I definitely want to go for kids the next couple of years. So I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, if not for poker, what would you be doing? I think I would have probably completed my engineering degree. No, and- no, not if you know, poker never happened. Poker is oh. illegal tomorrow. Oh, gotcha. What gotcha. do you do? Man, that's a really good question. I realize I like don't have that many like <laughs> real life skills. <laughs> I feel like I'm capable of like learning anything that that comes up, but I'd probably. Uh, well, you do have that degree. Yeah, <laughs> I'd like to be like out. That's my one like knock on poker is that you're not really like out in the world, like you know, making any sort of difference. It feels a bit selfish just playing cards so you can make money. So I'd probably be out in the world doing some sort of like. You know, something where I could make a decent living and have like a social impact. Do you wrestle with that at all? Like the poker? I mean, there's some people who who argue, you know, people are giving their money away. Might as well go to you. Mm-hmm. And there's other people who say, oh, you know, poker is not that bad. But do you feel like poker gives nothing back? And I, I don't think that it gives nothing back because I think, you know, people get to come and enjoy playing poker. And if yeah. you know, they, they make their own decisions, I'm all about that. Um, I'd say I wrestled with it more in the past. Now I'm, uh, I just try to make my positive difference in the world whenever I'm out, like dealing with people, interacting, um, just try to make their life better, be nice to them, you know, smile, yeah. say, you know, compliment them. So I feel like I'm giving back, giving back in that way. And life is short too. So you kind of have to do, uh, do what makes you happy. Speaking of which, uh, are you going to play poker forever? What's the plan? I will play poker in some capacity, probably forever, just because I absolutely love it. You're going to see Old Man Shore at the series in <laughs> yeah, yeah. 2050. Might, might win a bracelet in the year 2047. Yeah. <laughs> um, but playing poker for a living, is that? do you want to do that forever, or what do you want to do? Uh, I would not like it to be my sole source of income. Like my life for the last you know, 10 years has just been so much traveling. I've... I've I knew that I wanted to travel the world, so I'm glad I got to do that. And poker yeah. was a great, like, uh, facilitated that. Now that I'm, like, in Vegas and get to chill and be in my office and, you know, get into some other interest and, you know, scout out some other opportunities, I'm sure, like, I'll be using my time to get involved in some other stuff. All right. Are there any poker rules that should be altered or eliminated? I love the big blind ante, obviously, yeah. <laughs> as does everybody. Um <laughs> There's some stuff about like showing cards that's kind of annoying, like like dumb sometimes. Like I think at uh, on all ends and stuff. Like if you want to muck your cards, like you should be able to. Like no one colludes. Oh, yeah. No one colludes in the way that they like just give their stack to somebody in tournaments. Thought, you know. Like, I always thought that was a funny way of like addressing that issue. So for those listening who don't understand, when when somebody's all in in a poker tournament, TDA rules require that both hands be shown mm-hmm. 
even if that hand's clearly the loser. And but because for the reason is because they're worried that somebody could be chip dumping, mm-hmm. but no one ever chips dump their entire stack. Yeah, to somebody right. else. No, it never happens. So that's that's I guess my one. Uh, it does. My it always seems like a nice slap in the face to anybody who yeah. gets eliminated. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, you're busted. <laughs> By the way, we're gonna pull your cards out of the muck to show everybody how shitty your hand was. Yeah, you know what right. I mean? Like, why are we doing that to people? Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> uh, all right. Headphones on at the table, yes or no? I think that's cool. Uh, if it gets to a point where people like can't hear, which I really don't. It doesn't seem like that happens. Some people you hear complaining about that, but it doesn't seem like people have to ask that often, you know, about the action. I think they're normally pretty in tune. What about do you? Do oh, do I listen? Yeah. Um, not not usually. I'd say maybe ten percent of the time I do, and if I do, it's normally just like classical or jazz or like. Oh, that's my Na- next question. Nature sounds. To? Yeah, I think. Nature sounds. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, I think I'm pretty sure it's been proven. I'm definitely not the best multitasker, so mm-hmm. I, I just easily get distracted by stuff. So, so no like podcasts. <laughs> yeah. I'll, sometimes I'll listen to podcasts mm-hmm. if I'm playing like early on nine handed when I know I'm not going to, you know, be getting involved in that many pots. Yeah. The nice thing about listening to podcasts and stuff is then when you bust a tournament, you like at least feel like you gain some information along right. the way, you know. Whereas if you're just like listening to fucking nature sounds all day, you just bust and you're like, okay, it's four p.m. That's now, how I now feel. What? That's how I usually feel about the one free drink I got while I was at the tournament. You know what I mean? Like, oh, there's another grand or whatever, but at least I got that one oh, drink, right, 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 that one cocktail, thousand dollar <laughs> cocktail, exactly. <laughs> so uh, yeah, normally I. I kind of like being in touch with, uh, I like not being distracted at all. I like being in touch with every the energy of the table and stuff. Nature sounds interesting to me because you can't get further away from a, the, the clattering of the chips. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. We end the podcast the same way every time. Okay. With a question from the random question generator. All right. <laughs> this is an odd one. Yours is, uh, what riddles do you know? <laughs> Oh my god! Do you know any riddles? <laughs> what is a riddle? Is that just a joke, right? Uh, I think. There, or is there, has or to is be there a, a special, some sort of quiz element to it? If you're asking me what a riddle is, I'm guessing you don't have any off the top of your head. <laughs> oh my god! I'm Here's just... a perfect one for you. Okay. What's something you really resent paying for? Could be a one-time thing or mm-hmm. continually. Like I said, I'm pretty low maintenance, so I haven't made like too many, you know, spewed too many times. <laughs> Spew, is <a> Spew is a good way of saying splurge. Yeah. <laughs> um, and this isn't even, I guess, that crazy. But I, in 2008, I banked a tournament for maybe like 95k, and that's the time when everybody was getting the nice watches and oh stuff. Oh my god, I remember the I remember the poker player watch craze. Yeah. So it was I, a simpler time before Bitcoin. <laughs> right. <laughs> So I stacked off for about ten five on a bright line. Wow, is that it on your watch? I oh, that's not it. This is, <laughs> where is it? Uh, I actually sold it recently for about thirty three hundred. So. Okay, so you got some of it back. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was that was I guess my biggest spew, and then I've definitely spewed some at nightclubs back in the day and stuff, and just general nightlife. Yeah, but that's part- you had some some big bottle service bills over over the yeah over the years a little bit, but I think all that was like key to my social development too. So <laughs> what about something that's ongoing that you hate paying for? I was gonna say taxes, but you know I'm simple. <laughs> yeah, um, I get, I try to monitor like how much I spend on food because it's so easy. I mean, you can very easily average like a hundred bucks a day in food, especially in Vegas. That's about to say you picked the wrong town if you wanna. <laughs> I mean. I'm, I can't even remember the last time my wife and I cooked at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Luckily, my fiance so Joy does a bunch of cooking for me, and that you know that adds a lot to the bottom line. And it's I just feel like when we cook, like our stuff tastes better anyway. Yeah. Though. I got some recommendations for you around here. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> I mean, I, I will be eating a lot of the Vegas food, but I'll I'll be keeping an eye on it too. All right, Shannon. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Julia. Appreciate it. That's the podcast. Uh, Thank you for listening to it. More thanks to Shannon for coming on the show and for welcoming me into his home. Go ahead and follow him on Twitter, at Shannon Shore. Uh, You can follow us on Twitter, at Poker Stories. That's uh, Poker underscore Stories. Or at Card Player Media. 
If you like the show, please go ahead and do the subscribe thing wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks.